Okay, good morning everyone. Please start taking your seats because the session is about to begin. Please take your seats. The show will start momentarily. And if you can please close the doors. Is any, thank you. Uh, there's, there's a block at the bottom, yeah. You have to kneel down. Okay, so third and final day for the conference. Uh, we have a session all dedicated to uh, creativity for engineering and science. David, you already met him yesterday, is an engineer, but also a psychologist and also an excellent presenter. So I don't need to introduce him again. He will be talking about creativity for engineers. David, the floor is yours. All right, well, I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but you'll remember that yesterday I said I surround myself by psychologists. So, so my father's a psychologist, my students are all psychologists, but I neglected to mention that my wife is also a psychologist, but she's a clinical psychologist, so... Yeah, 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 that's right. And so when I, when I finally go crazy with all this creativity stuff, she'll be able to cure me, so... Can you bring up the presentation for me? Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I had a much longer presentation and of course realized that uh, not only would I not get through it all in 15 or so minutes, but also that a lot of the things have been covered already by previous speakers. So I was going to talk a bit about the four Ps and aspects of how those relate to engineering creativity, but I think that's, that's not so necessary now. So what I'd like to do is to give you my uh, little take on why I think creativity is important in the domain of, of engineering in particular and in the way that it relates to technology and, and to provide some of that rationale for, for at least from the point of view of, create, of engineering, why it plays such an important role. Uh, and I want to do that by introducing you first of all to a, a made up equation. Uh, and this was uh, made up by Paul Pilzer who's an economist. And uh, he came up with the equation that W is equal to P times T to the N to explain the relationship between the wealth of a nation uh, the amount of physical resources that that nation has and the role that technology plays. So while it's a, just a, a you know, hypothetical equation, it makes the point that technology, because it's raised to the power of n and just you know, playing along and assuming that n is greater than 1, uh, that technology has a disproportionate effect on the wealth of a nation. And indirectly, or perhaps directly, therefore, uh, there's a relationship between engineering and the creativity of engineering design and so on because of the, the link to technology. So technology exerts a disproportionate effect on the wealth of a nation, in particular because it determines what is a physical resource or what becomes a physical resource. In other words, uh, to take a, an example that's relevant to, to many countries, think about oil. Without technology to do things like drill, pump, transport, refine, transform, and so on, oil is just a thick black liquid lying underground. With technology, however, it becomes a source of power, a lubricant, plastics, and all sorts of other things. In other words, it solves problems and satisfies needs. So technology turns oil from something useless, effectively, into something that's useful. Technology also acts further than that because it solves new problems. It, it solves the problems that when we have to move beyond oil because of the cost or the scarcity or because of uh, issues like pollution, technology solves the problem of replacing oil with other sources of energy. So it, technology turns sunlight into electricity. It turns wind into electricity. It enables us to make use of those things to power electric vehicles, for example. So again, why is creativity important? Well, the, the technology that I've been describing, that, that idea of, of W is equal to P times T to the N, really encapsulates the fact that problems, in engineering at least, come from two sources. They come from the supply side, and you can think of that uh, in the context of new technologies become available, so the, the problem that we try to satisfy then, for example, is how do we exploit solid state transistors? A new technology brings with it new opportunities and in effect new problems that we can try and solve. 
So those are supply side problems, but there's also demand side problems that perhaps are, are a little bit more common uh, you know, in, in the sort of general space. So customers make new demands. For example, when customers say we're sick of paying the prices that we pay for electricity, we want cheaper electricity, then that sort of demand problem, a new demand, generates or, or uh, stimulates new solutions. So engineering creativity is fundamentally about generating new and effective solutions to those new problems. And somebody yesterday mentioned the quotation from Albert Einstein about, you know, we won't solve uh, these problems with the same sort of methods that, that we created them. Um, and the idea there is, you know, if we said we want cheaper electricity or cleaner electricity, and if our solution was simply to say, well, just burn more oil, clearly we're applying an old solution to a problem. We have to generate new solutions. It's not good enough simply to, to keep reapplying the same solution. So the idea of the newness of the solution, but also the effectiveness is key there. And of course, you, you know straight away that what we're talking about when we mention novelty and effectiveness fundamentally is creativity. So uh, one of the other challenges or aspects of engineering creativity is that it doesn't just stop with the idea generation, as several of our speakers mentioned yesterday. So if creativity is about generating effective novelty, then the wider process of turning those ideas into usable solutions uh, in other words, innovation is about exploiting effective novelty. So the creativity is necessary but not sufficient for that broader process of innovation. And the two go hand in hand. So, uh, you know, I often, uh, although you know, probably shouldn't, uh, use the terms almost interchangeably because of the, the close connection between the two. And when we go back and think about engineering, then the, the essence of, of this creativity in engineering, the generation of these new and effective solutions, is really what we mean by design in engineering, and in fact, it, it corresponds to design in other contexts that some of our speakers uh, talked about yesterday. Uh, the quotation here, I won't read it all out, but it just makes a, a key point, again, that some of our speakers yesterday uh, touched on, that when we're dealing with situations that have only a single right answer, then it's fine to think convergently. But when we're dealing with situations that have more than one right answer or more than one possible solution, and when selecting among those solutions requires, or generating the solutions requires the creativity and then the ability to select among them and make a choice, then we're talking about divergent thinking and creativity. But it also makes the point that those two activities, the divergent thinking and the convergent thinking, are, are both necessary as part of the process of creativity. And again, it's something that our speakers yesterday uh, drew our attention to. So if we try to represent that in a the diagrammatic form, the idea of engineering design and also really engineering creativity, then uh, the, if you look left to right on that diagram, we typically start with a problem or a need. For example, how can we generate cheaper electricity? We generate a number of possible solutions, which is our idea of thinking divergently or synthesis. We then select among those ideas in other words, we begin or we then move on to a phase of analysis or thinking convergently to select the best of those. And which is the best uh, depends on the criteria for our particular problem. It may be that there are occasions when we're not so concerned about novelty, when we're focusing primarily on effectiveness. And there will be other situations where we want to emphasize more the novelty to take advantage of, say, a new idea or to establish a, a new uh, market for a product and to make it more difficult for our competitors. But I want to emphasize also the fact that in an engineering context, uh, while engineering creativity requires novelty and effectiveness, these things can be present in different degrees depending on the, the situation and the problem that we're trying to solve. So it's not that we have to have every new bridge design being the most radically novel design in the world. There's plenty of room in the world for bridges that are merely effective and not novel. But there are, of course, situations where novelty is important as well. So it's a, a kind of balancing act or a trade-off between novelty and effectiveness. Now, when we move from left to right in that diagram, uh, and I have to explain my background in engineering is in a, a discipline called systems engineering. And we certainly think very much in a top-down sense uh, in systems engineering, going from the need through to the solution. There is another acceptable form of engineering design, if you look at kind of two extremes, and that's moving from right to left, where we begin with a solution, in effect, and we match that to a problem or a need, and we talk about the idea of bottom-up design. Now, systems engineers don't like bottom-up design as much because it's not seen to be 
the, the method that leads to the best possible solutions, but it is a way that we sometimes have to operate. Uh, for example, in the, the systems engineering context I work in, uh, is very much related to defence, so building ships and submarines. And there are occasions in that sort of context where you have some pre-existing equipment, a new need, and it's really a matter of making the bottom up match the top down. So there are two fundamental uh, paradigms that we can adopt. But what I wanted to uh, draw your attention to is, is one, what I think is a, a slight curiosity. Uh, think about the alternate uses test for a second. So looking at the right-hand side of the diagram, we start a, a typical divergent thinking test in creativity with a question like, what can I do with a tin can? But I'm going to suggest to you that that's not really representative of how we think divergently in engineering because it doesn't represent a top-down process. And while it's certainly divergent in the sense that we're going from one to many, it's kind of going, uh, it being divergent in the wrong direction for, a, for an engineering design process. So I like to think of that not so much as divergent thinking, but non-convergent thinking. Now, that doesn't matter, and it's not that we need to, to change how we think of creativity, but I am sort of throwing out there to the community uh, the fact that maybe we need to reconceive the idea of a divergent thinking test for engineers to be more representative of how engineering design takes place. So when we think of what can I do with a tin can, we think, well, it could be a suit of armor for a mouse, it could be a cup, a rattle, uh, a pen holder, but that's not how engineers typically think. We don't sit around and say, here's a brick. What are all the things that I could do with that brick? And say, well, I, I know I could build a house. What typically happens is the top-down process where somebody comes and says, I need a new house, and then you go through the divergent process of thinking, well, I could do that with bricks, I could do it with wood, I could do it with mud, I could do it in a variety of ways. And we select the best of those. Just wait for the truck to go past. So it is rem uh, reminiscent of the, uh, the alternate uses test, but in, to my mind, it's sort of forcing us to think in a bottom-up fashion. So what I'm interested in is, uh, from a top-down point of view, and, and divergent thinking in, crea in engineering is starting on the left-hand side where the question is the need. How can I transport baked beans? And then a tin can may be one possible solution, but we could also imagine that we could transport them in a Ziploc bag, in my hands, in my shoe, in my pocket. There's a variety of ways. And then the second stage of engineering creativity requires us to think convergently to select which of those satisfies the need best. And it may be, as I said before, that we're trying to, to, to maximize novelty in some situations, or we may simply want to, to replicate a, a solution that we know works well. Another aspect here that ties in with the, that Albert Einstein quotation about solving you know, problems with the same thinking that caused them is you might say, well, why not just build a tin can? It's a perfectly good solution. Why do we need to be creative in that situation? The motivator for the creativity uh, with this example might be, for example, that let's imagine there's a worldwide shortage of steel. So we no longer have the option of building uh, a method for transporting baked beans out of a, by making a steel can, and we're forced to find a new solution. So there's an example where circumstances would force us to pay more attention to the novelty aspect of the solution as well as the effectiveness in order to satisfy the need. And the same process occurs when, when we start to say, well, it's no longer acceptable to cause the level of pollution that we are by, by burning oil, so we have to rule oil out as a solution for how do I generate electricity, and then we're forced to look at more novel solutions as well as solutions that will be effective. So to understand the role that creativity plays in engineering, uh, a sensible starting point, of course, is the existing body of knowledge, and I've already mentioned yesterday that that body of knowledge resides primarily in the domain of, uh, or the discipline of psychology. And we've also learned yesterday uh, and the day before much more about the four Ps, the person, the product, the process, and the press, or place. Uh, I'd like to suggest my fifth P is the pack, meaning the team. So it's a, a, perhaps an area that's sort of, and some speakers have already talked about the team aspects, but. If, if I was going to add a fifth P, it would be P for pack. Uh, so one of my sort of abiding messages is that we should be careful to avoid reinventing the wheel. Otherwise, we're going to spend all our time going back and reconsidering the four Ps and reconsidering the, the sort of fundamental knowledge instead of moving forward and applying that in new domains and, and new disciplines. And now, I also mentioned yesterday that uh, the, the paper I presented yesterday was, was really... 
um, a reductionist approach looking only at the person. And Beth and Christina and so on were talking about systems approaches. My own uh, take on the, the systems approach to creativity and innovation is encapsulated in this diagram here. Uh, with my colleague and father, Arthur Cropley, we developed this thing that we call the innovation phase model. And what we've tried to do here is capture the, the process of innovation that involves creativity and exploitation. We've tried to capture the role that the four Ps play in that. And those are listed down uh, the first column, but you'll see that there are six rows because we've broken out person into its three component parts, motivation, personal properties, and feelings, because we felt that those are, are particularly important. And what we've tried to capture is a very, what we feel is a very important idea that's uh, often a limiting factor for organizations. And that is the fact that what's good for creativity and innovation in one of those phases, so one of the vertical columns, is not necessarily good for innovation in another one. And the example that we've just been looking at about engineering design illustrates that point very nicely. If you look at the green and, and the yellow columns that really are the core of idea generation and then analyzing those ideas, you can imagine that if your company was optimized only to think divergently, then you're going to be very good at the generation phase, the yellow column, but you may find it very difficult to progress through the illumination phase, the green column, because your, your potential, your predisposition is to divergent thinking. So we see this uh, really as a roadmap for organizations to understand that when they're in a particular phase, this diagram describes the constellation of personal properties, thinking styles, management styles that will give you the best result for innovation in that phase. And then when you move on to the next phase, you'll recognize that you may have to change your style of thinking, style of management. You may have to change and, and foster different personal properties in order to get the best result. So there's almost sort of a unique constellation of, or a unique profile to facilitate creativity in every stage. And I think one of the problems that organizations often face is that they're naturally well set up for one of those phases, say, but by definition then they're not so well set up for some of the other phases. So they run into roadblocks where they find they can't progress through the process effectively because, as I said before, perhaps they're naturally good divergent thinkers but not so good at convergent thinking. Or another way I, I sometimes describe that is if a company came to me and said, well, we're having trouble with our process of innovation, and somebody said, well, go off and send everybody in your company off to do a, a brainstorming course. That's fine, and they might come back very skilled at divergent thinking, but then find, and it would be no surprise, they find they're struggling with the convergent thinking. So it's a, a matter of knowing which, which of these uh, components, which of the four Ps is active at any given point in time, and, and kind of going with the flow, understanding that sometimes you need to think divergently, sometimes convergently, I've, now I've picked on thinking style as the main example, but the same applies to the kind of uh, organizational climate, a high demand management environment versus a low demand environment, or there are situations where you want people to be risk takers, other times where you want them to be risk averse, and it's a matter of understanding where you are in the process and adapting to that process. So I think, uh, in fact, we've developed an instrument in association with this, and harking back to Mark Runko's point about creative potential, you can imagine that this gives us a roadmap for understanding the organizational innovation potential and then mapping accordingly or, or moving through that process uh, in a way that, that gets the best result in each phase. Yep. So that's all I wanted to say except to, to do a bit of shameless self-promotion. Uh, so the middle book there, and, and it's kind of by way of also thanking some of my collaborators. So. Uh, I mentioned, and Giovanni mentioned in the, in the little introduction yesterday, along with Mark Runco and James Kaufman and Arthur, uh, we edited the book on the dark side of creativity back in 2010. Arthur and I have, uh, in the middle book there, Fostering Creativity in Higher Education and Organizations, is a more general book looking at, at a lot of these principles as they apply both in education and in an organizational sense. And the, the bottom corner there is the one that we brought out this year. And just to, because of the topic today, uh, I'm, I've just signed a contract for a book on engineering creativity with Academic Press that should come out in the latter half of next year. So thank you very much, and, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. And I've enjoyed the other presentations so far, and I'm looking forward to the rest of today as well. Thank you very much, David. We have a question from Sins. An observation, actually. Um, 
I love your model, it's great. I noticed that when you were talking about your preparation stage, how can I transport something, that you were actually using divergent thinking to get to your convergent, clear definition of your problem. Because your transport wasn't about simply carrying or having a container or throwing. So could you speak to that first impetus of having it be divergent before convergent? Yep. Yeah, it's a, a very good point, and, and I mean, it goes back to, uh, I'll answer it as quickly as possible, in, certainly in systems engineering and conceptual design, and, and you know, I picked up on, on a similar concept in your presentation, uh, we try to describe the problem as a function. And certainly the engineers in the room will recognize that idea of you know, functional requirements, and in particular, I like to teach the students to describe the function as a verb-noun pair. So transport beans, carry weight, whatever it is. But if you do that in the most abstract way possible, then you, you don't constrain yourself to a particular design. So you know, as you described, if you, you keep it as uh, abstract and solution-free as possible, you, you keep the, the um, description of the problem such that you, you give yourself the best possible chance of finding the, the widest range of solutions. But that idea of a verb, noun, pair to describe the problem uh, okay. is a really good one. Question from Vincer. Just one other uh, question. The uh, phase diagram gave me the impression that you had a kind of linear view of how engineering works, and I hope that's not the case because my experience in engineering is that you go through many cycles yep. discovering that uh, one idea or another doesn't work. You have to come back, do more design, and resolve uh, you know inefficiencies and things like that. Yeah, yep. absolutely. So uh, as, as Vince said, the you know, the reality of the engineering process is that there's many loops, two steps forward, one step back, and, and, you know, in the same idea of a sort of waterfall model of design, that's a very simplistic representation, at least to, to kind of get the conversation going about the, the fundamental stages, but they, they may not happen in that order, or, you know, they, you may repeat some, so absolutely, it's, it's a simplistic representation of, of engineering design. Okay, thanks again. Okay, David. thank you very much. Okay, so we move on to the second presentation. This will be delivered by Francois Pachet, who has a PhD in artificial intelligence, but also is a civil engineer by training. He's also a music musician and a composer, and that, I guess, is why he is leading a team at Sony, um, a computer science laboratory, in which is the, the direct now, developing this uh, tool for uh, automatic composition of music. Francois, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yes, I will try to, to convey a very simple message uh, today. I'm not a psychologist, but uh, uh, I will try to, to say something that makes kind of makes sense for the audience, uh, which is basically, so we are interested in uh, understanding crea individual creativity. To, to be a bit provocative, I, I don't, I've never seen any example of anything interesting created by more than one person. Uh, and we are interested in building tools that help people um, not necessarily do something creative, but let's say uh, <clears throat> reach their limits and or possibly go beyond. And so the, this project here I want to talk about uh, is called Flow Machines. And I, I have to say why it's called Flow Machines. It's uh, by reference to, uh, to the flow theory by uh, Csikszentmihalyi. I don't think this guy has been really... Uh, uh, evoked a lot uh, here yet. It's a bit. Uh, Oops, this should be working. Oh, great. Sorry. Um, sorry, this is really not something I like to do. Okay, so in this theory, the flow theory by Csikszentmihalyi, you know probably this idea that the flow states, the states where creative people typically are, are, are reached when the, uh, there is a nice balance between the skills that you have and the challenge that you have to, to address. 
And uh, the, the key idea in this theory is to, is to understand how this uh, flow state works, how, how it's reached, how you can help people do that. And it's, uh, it has been a very, very successful theory in uh, psychology and also education and uh, creativity studies. And it's a theory that actually engineers like a lot because it's uh, very simple to understand and it can, it can yield many, you know, it can give uh, rise to many, uh, many models. Uh, there is a problem with the theory, though, which is that basically it's very nice to explain how people, you know, get flow states when they are beginners, when they are training, where they are students, that is, when they acquire skills. The problem is that m most of the great creators that we know, so here we are talking uh, about Picasso, for instance, well, the, after, after a point, they are very, very good at whatever they are doing. Uh, Picasso was a very good painter, and he was very good at drawing, and he didn't create anything when, when he was actually uh, training. And so there is an extra step that is not really taken into account in the theory, which is, you know, when, how, does it, how do actually uh, creative people do manage to, manage to create stuff? Uh, they don't just acquire new skills endlessly. And the idea that we want to pursue here is that you know, after a while, what, what's going on is that basically people st stop acquiring new skills basically because they have all the skills that are needed. But they, they try to invent a new style. So style, in some sense, is the extension of skills in that view. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, also another claim we do, which is a bit maybe we can, it's debatable, but uh, there is no single creative work of art, for instance. There are always many of them. So, for instance, Picasso is well known for the, uh, the paintings of uh, the famous uh, bull pa bulls uh, that he drew. He, he, and uh, he's very famous, famous for, for one of these paintings. But actually, there are, he did a lot of them. So he did not invent a new painting. He invented a new way of doing paintings, in fact, a new style. And really, uh, the key here is not to understand how a particular object was created, but how this style was uh, created. And the key idea here that what we say that very often, not probably not all the time, but uh, I'm just saying this again, very often new styles are created by manipulating, really, uh, literally, the styles of uh, other people, of, of your predecessors, for instance. So, for instance, Picasso spent a lot of years uh, drawing and painting in the styles of Velázquez, for instance, and many other paintings he liked, before he started to invent a new way of drawing. And in that, in that case, for instance, he invented this kind of, uh, well, it's not really cubism, but, you know, very, very essential, simple line drawings. And so, uh, the key idea here is that we see style, so in our, let's say, engineering perspective, as a kind of texture, so texture, so, so a bit like when you have on the left a texture of leopard, so it's, a, it's called a texture in a image uh, in computer vision, we can call it a style, and then basically what you have is that you have a new situation or new constraints or new uh, ideas or whatever, so we call them constraints, or you can call them structure, uh, and then the, the difficulty is to apply the style of the, 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 that you have on the left to the new structure to create something new. And the thing you, you create here, in this case, you, you create a, a rhino with the, the, the skin of a leopard, is new. So is it interesting and creative? This I, I have no idea. But what I want to emphasize is that very often creative stuff are made like that. That by take, taking a new, uh, an existing style, a way of doing, a texture, whatever, a new situation and, put, and being somehow able to put them together. And this is very difficult to do, technically, to apply or to unfold, unfold a style to a new situation. So I, for instance, in the, the case of the, uh, music, the Beatles, so I, we can argue for hours about the Beatles, but I mean, uh, some of the songs like Eleanor Rigby or, uh, or, or uh, and, and others are typically made, were created by using the style of uh, classical quartet music and applying to the constraints of pop music is very clear. You can really re-explain uh, all these songs using this, this metaphor. Uh, now, okay, how do you do that? And uh, the, the goal of this project is really to help people create their own style by manipulating the styles of others. So now we go back a little bit you know, uh, below and uh, start to wonder about how it works. Uh, I want to mention that there is a very uh, famous, there are very famous theories for, uh, for talking about style from a mathematical viewpoint, in, in, in particular Markov chain, so I will not talk about that technically here, but Markov is very interesting. 
invented Markov change, which is a very, very powerful statistical tool to actually model style in, in sequences, in text, in music, and in economy, and in many other domains. But he, he invented Markov change by actually studying what was creative in, the, in Pushkin's, uh, Eugene Onegin's uh, poems. Uh, poem. So he started counting letters and stuff like that, and then he discovered basically Markov change. By studying, he wanted to really understand also what was creative there. Another, another, another great genius of probabilities, Kolmogorov, uh, also who invented uh, you know, theories of uh, you know, complexities, was basically uh, <coughs> uh, trying to understand what was creative also, how, how, could, how could you could actually measure the creativity of a text. And this is how th this guy came to many models that we are actually using now. And uh, uh, so I will skip that. The starting point of the project was this, this, this system, which was basically a Markov model of music. So the idea is that you, you let people play or improvise on a, on a piano, and then the system, system is going to try to capture the style, your style, your way of playing, very quickly using Markov models, let's say, to go quickly, and uh, answer very, in a kind of interactive way, propose you answers to whatever you are, you are playing. Here the, the, the pianist is improvising on the, on the piano. The stem is listening. And uh, and when the, the, the musician, musician stops and the system is updating his model and tries to make a continuation, this is why it's called continuator, in the same style. It's not, it's not going to repeat, of course, exactly what was played. Is going to try to invent a new phrase or new phrases with the same motifs uh, by recombining in the, exactly the same way that Markov and uh, Kolmogorov uh, suggested to do uh, already a very long time ago. And uh, so we did a lot of studies about this uh, with these, those systems. It was very striking to see that when you, you take a musician and you put it in front of a, st a style imitation system that actually tries to capture his style and very interesting things happen. Uh, people get hooked, people get fascinated because they can see basically themselves amplified. They can see the limits of their style, in fact, even if they're not really aware of what it is exactly. And so it has a lot of very interesting um, effect that we, we, we started to, to, uh, to study. Um, the same thing, exactly the same system, the same phenomena. Happen with children, in this case Italian children, which are confronted to the same system. That is basically the system tries to always produce answers at the same level. So in the flow diagram, the skills and the challenge are really on the diagonal. So this was a one day. So you get you generate excitement, fascination by a system that does not generate anything interesting per se, of course, but generates something that you find interesting because it's exactly at your level in the flow diagram. But what's interesting is that later on, uh, two days later in that case, the guy, the child, by the way, these children had never played piano before, so they are really, the skills is equal to zero practically at the beginning. So after a while, by being confronted to their own style, uh, they are pushed somehow to invent something new. So this guy, after two days, did that. Oops, sorry. Uh, tired of this uh, way of playing.
So it's quite fascinating to see why if you're a musician, it's almost perfect arpeggios in the style of Bach. I mean, tonally, it's almost perfect. Of course, the child doesn't know what he's doing, really. What I want to stress on is the fact that if you are confronted to a style imitation system, it, it, it has very interesting effect on uh, the, 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 your, let's say, your drive to innovate, your drive to do something different, your drive to, to go to, to reach your, your limits and stuff like that. In a completely autonomous way, there is no interaction by teachers or what, what, uh, whatsoever. And so, in this project, we are trying, we're really trying using various sorts of techniques that I will not describe, of course, which, which constitute the core of the project. Uh, we're trying to really push this idea further and, and see how, to see how we can capture the style of very many different situations, so in music and in text. So for instance, in this case, using much more sophisticated techniques than Markov chains, but I will not uh, uh, talk about them uh, today. But here, for instance, what, what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm a jazz musician, I'm not a pianist or a flutist, but I'm trying to teach the system my way of playing jazz so that the, the system can then play jazz a little bit better, I mean, a little bit faster, more accurately, and things like that, so that I can, con but then I can, I just want to control and say stuff that when I want, when I want a phrase to start, to end, the speed, and that kind of thing, but then basically the system is filling in the blanks for, so in this, in this case, I'm playing the real uh, pianist, and controlling with a, a Wemo, oh, I don't hear very well, the flute sound. The flute sound is doing very fast jazz phrases, which are... It's possible to have a little bit more sound. The videos are on the web. So basically we are trying to, to explore uh, the idea that uh, what happens when I'm able to play these phrases which are really only generated by, from my style, but, but yet that I'm not really able to produce. So what happens when I am at the region, at the frontier of the Vygotsky, the zone of proximal development, if you want. And uh, <coughs> we are exploring this idea in, ver in very different situations. For instance, I'm just showing some examples very quickly. Uh, also, we're trying to model... Uh, Jazz is, is also playing with people, and so here we've tried to, to address the issue of how can you capture the style of a rhythm section, a bass player, a drum player, a piano that are going to play along with a solo uh, musician. And so what you can see here is a human sax on the right, or on the top it's the same, controlling by his playing what the virtual agents on the bottom, so a guitar in that case, uh, drum and bass, We'll try to play music according to the style of the respective uh, players that we have recorded before, but yet we'll adapt to uh, the playing of the human player in real time. So you are not, it's not a minus one recording, it's a dynamic generation of music in the style of these three uh, 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 rhythm section guys. And so what you can hear... That uh, sorry for the sound, it's not loud enough, so you can't hear much. Well, the idea is that uh, when you play fast, when you play loud, then the rhythm section gets excited and plays right, tries really to be adaptive to what you play, and conversely. And so you don't play with an MP3 file, you really play with virtual agent. But here the key, the key uh, technical issue we're trying to do is how to be sure that the, what is generated actually conforms to the style of the original musician while being adaptive to a new constraints, in this case, given in real time. Um, so I just want to, to, to con conclude by the last example that I showed a lot of st stuff in music. We are doing exactly the same thing as in text, and it's quite interesting. Uh, in text, so just to give you an example of the kinds of things we are able to do with the, those techniques. So it's, uh, here we take the lyrics of yesterday, the, long, the song Yesterday by the Beatles. You can see yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away there. And then we extract what we call the prosody, the rhythm of the word. Yesterday is strong, uh, weak, strong, one, zero, one. So the, the prosody is on the second column and the rhyme structure, away, stay, is a rhyme, and then be, me, is another rhyme. And then we say, what about keeping the constraint? What, what about keeping the structure of the song? That is a prosody, basically, 
the rhyme structure and, and possibly the syntax, but in another style, not the style of um, Paul McCartney in that, in that case, but for instance, the, the style of uh, Bob Dylan. So we take Bob Dylan's songs, uh, we, we build a Markov model, we apply our techniques, and this is Yesterday by Bob Dylan. So you can check that the, the prosody is satisfied. Yesterday, innocence, oh, uh, all my troubles seem so far away. So actually, there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the prosody of each word. The syntax is correct. The rhymes are correct. And it's perfectly Markovian, and it is in the style of Bob Dylan, as you can see, because you see winds blowing somewhere, so you can see, okay. So I am in the style of Bob Dylan, and I, and I satisfy constraint, and of course, if I can do that, I can do this for any, anyone, um, including myself. And so to conclude, what I, the message is really that there are lots of very interesting new techniques, uh, quite recent techniques, that, that basically enable us to, to to model style as a computational object. And the message here is about to link this with creativity studies that basically individual creativity is really about creating styles, it's not about creating artifacts. Artifacts are just instances of some style. And this is really the hard thing. So what we're trying to do is to build a system to help people do that by helping them manipulate style, which is a complex operation actually, uh, both for humans and for machines. Uh, and we also think that, that there is actually a new industry of content to be uh, uh, f to be predicted, which in which you will uh, you will you can imagine that content, music, text is losing its value. I mean, today music is for you get music for free on the on the net. Come on, the value is zero. But the style of the composer, the style of the performance has a lot of value. So these style objects now with those methods can become really. Uh, new ways of uh, seeing content, uh, distributing content, and let's say uh, in being um, creative in music, in text, and in general in all sequ sequential forms of, of, of art. Okay, I'm sorry, I think it was a bit long. Okay, thank you very much. Questions from Francois, please. In the creation of style, as being the object of the activity, do you believe you will be able to protect the intellectual property of style? Yes, it's a very good question. So we are, it's a very important subject. We, and it's a complete, uh, how do you call that, the no man's land, I mean, in terms of uh, you know, laws and everything. Very, even the contract that you have with artists, with musicians, or even writers do not mention anything. Uh, the only problem that we know about Mirko is one specialist is uh, so-called plagiarism. So if someone copies a large chunk of what you have written or composed, then you can have a trial. But what about creating a text or a piece of music where I copied only bits of two or two seconds or two words and I can guarantee that there is no bit larger than two words? And what, what are you going to sue me for, you know? Because all the words are common common uh, assets. So this question has never been addressed yet. It's going to be one of the, the main questions of, uh, let's say, the jurisdiction of uh, digital art. So we are, we are thinking about it, but I don't have any answer. David? I was interested in your uh, admittedly claim to be controversial, uh, claim at the beginning that um, you did not think that it was possible for anything more than one individual to create anything interesting. And I suspect that that comment applies, and I can easily agree, in the creative arts. But I'm not sure that I would agree that that applies to engineering. And I think you probably have a continuum from the individuality of creative arts up to the teams that create great engineering. So let me give you an example of that. Uh, today we have the Marconi Symposium, which does actually, this time, go to one individual, Marty Cooper, for the invention of the mobile phone. But in many cases, we have given the, the prize to two. If you look at the Nobel Prize, that bellwether of creativity in, in physics, chemistry, there's an increasing movement to give that to two or even three people. And I spend a lot of my time um, sitting on panels which judge these things, and I know how hard it is to identify the creative spark. 
So uh, perhaps you'd like to comment on that. Yes, I mean, of course, I'm very prov provocative, so if you push me hard, I will not resist a long time, but still, I think that uh, people also confuse uh, creativity and in innovation. For innovation, you always need very big team. I mean, to send someone on the moon, you cannot do it alone, of course. Uh, but real creativity, I'm talking about Paul McCartney, Bobby Fischer, the great chess player, completely crazy guy. Most of these guys are alone, Many of them are autistic people. Most of them have, have Asperger syndrome, so they are not even able to work with someone else. And you mentioned uh, uh, the, the tendency to, to attribute Nobel Prize to couples. That's right. For instance, Daniel Kahneman, a great genius in psychology, always said that he owed so much to Tversky. It was a couple. Uh, and when you find in your life one guy, one person with whom you can work efficiently, it's uh, a miracle. It's a chance of your life. I mean, it's so great. I don't believe it can happen with more than two. So I said one, I have, okay, two. <laughs> Maximum. No, but I was really saying, give me an example. In music, in, in literature, in, in science, in mathematics, in physics, uh, not engineering, not innovation, really pure creativity. I, I was... I think it's really most of the time single or couples. But okay. uh, I mean, I can. Um, this discussion is very, very interesting. We can take it on again offline. So thanks again, Francois. <laughs> and actually, this leads us perfectly into the next presentation, which will dwell upon competition versus collaboration in teams for uh, creativity in engineering. Uh, this will be delivered by Andrea Sur Survek. She's an uh, associate professor at the Vil William Coyle uh, Civil Engineering in South Dakota. And uh, Dean Jensen, also professor teaching industrial engineering and engineering management at the same institution. And so the floor is yours, Andrea. Um, thank you very much. Um, there's a kind of a thing at engineering conferences that there's this really good probability that you get to go after someone boring. And so your presentation always looks better and you have not made that possible at this conference, particularly after the last talk, so uh, we'll do what we can. Um, anyway, so on September 8th, 2012, my colleague and I, with the extraordinary assistant of, assistance of two undergraduate research assistants, about 15 volunteers and 64 willing guinea pigs, if you will, embarked on this sort of insane endeavor that mixed something along the lines of a reality show like Project Runway or Top Chef with a Rube Goldberg competition in the attempt to try and spur our engineering students to be more creative through a competitive environment. So we were looking at developing creativity through competition. I have to start by saying, though, that this is not how this whole endeavor started out. Um, in fact, a lot of it started out on a napkin at a brew pub, like great creative, creative ideas do, um, and was developed from a mobile computing grant. So we were looking at how do we get teams of engineers to develop things at a distance with just some mobile computing. Um, it was originally called the Apollo 13 Project. Um, based on the fact that, you know, the Apollo 13 astronauts were stuck in state space with a problem that had to get fixed on the ground. So, during the process of this, though, we were looking at um, the U.S. National Academy of Engineers produced this report called the Engineer of 2020 that basically said, okay, you have to be technically proficient and you have to have communication skills. But above and beyond that, we want this Engineer of 2020 to be dynamic, agile, resilient and flexible, and we jokingly refer to this as our engineers have to be DARF. Um, but above and beyond that, they need to be creative. Okay. So you have a bunch of engineering faculty members who were not raised to be creative, who now have to develop engineers who are creative. Great, how do we go about doing this? So we talked a lot, or we've heard a lot in the last couple of days about creativity versus risk aversion. Creativity takes courage. You have to take risks. There is a very rational reason in engineering why we are risk averse. As I like to tell my students, doctors can only kill one person at a time. 
So, so there is an, a sort of inherent thing there that we don't want to go too far out on the limb. So we stick to standard paradigms of teaching engineers. Very linear. Um, we give them very constrained problems that lead to a correct answer to develop their technical skills. I've um, become sort of fascinated with this idea of creativity and neurobiology. I know about this much about it, so um, I will give you a very top-level idea here, but um, uh, based on, on some work that's been published right lately, if you look, the, the green area of the brain there is kind of what lights up under one of these functional MRIs when you're doing things that are typical engineering, linear thinking, detail processing, paying attention to, to numbers and equations, and the type of things that we're generally known for, the red area of the brain is the imagination network. It's what allows you to take ideas from 17 different things and bring them together into something new. And there's very little overlap. The idea is you actually have to stop being an engineer for a few minutes to go out and be creative. Um, so great, what do we do to kind of shut down standard engineering instincts that we have drilled into students for years to get them to be creative? Well, we start by messing with their idea that things have to be high technology with low uncertainty, all wrapped up in this nice system of constraints, and we lower the technology, and we raise the uncertainty, and we essentially chuck the constraints out the window. Step one. Step two is we lower the risk for them. We set up a competition that was on a weekend that had nothing to do with their grades. There was no grading, right? And we set up a reward system, or I think someone described it as sort of a group threat. Um, the reward was that there was a cash prize. The first prize was $1,000 for the team that won, which is a lot when you're a, an engineering student, particularly in the middle of South Dakota. And the threat was actually that we sort of created this atmosphere that, so, MEs, you think you're better than the civils, huh? Yeah, come prove it. And, and students react to that sort of thing. There's this natural competition between disciplines at our institution. Um, we also wanted to get from this idea of divergent thinking, but they had to converge on something that was functional. Ultimately, it had to work. All right, so we gave them a very simple problem. You have a tennis ball. It is sitting on a blue foam disc. Um, my very attention detail partner reminded me that the blue foam disc was horizontal, but I couldn't find a picture, sorry. So um, they had to get the, the, the tennis ball. Basically, there was a, a little red basket, the kind you get fish and chips in, on a stick in a bucket. Very high tech scenario here, right? And the goal was to get the ball into the bucket, or into the, the basket. That was it. So we gave them a setup that looked like this. Notice ball, disc, bucket, <laughs> basket, you know, like really, really high tech scenario. Um, they had a, a little space in which to do this. And in order to do this, we, uh, there's no more polite way to put this than we gave them piles of crap. I mean, just literally piles of stuff. Um, think of it as a found materials challenge. So there were pill bottles, there was cardboard, there was glass, they could actually break things, little toy cars, I mean just anything that, that we could find, recycle, get donated, we had in a pile for them. Um, just to keep things interesting, and because remember this was a mobile computing grant, distance teaming, we took two of them and we put them down on the design floor. So they were down there with the materials and were going to be required, or on the build floor, to require to build this thing. The other half of the team was up in the design office and there was a laptop between them. So they had to do this, all right? We basically had 16 teams, four people per team, two in a design office and two on the build floor. They had three hours to confer about the design before they ever got to touch the materials. What we didn't want was for them to just grab stuff and start throwing it together and see what came out. We wanted them to have to actually think about what was there and what they would design with it. And then, just to make things more interesting, because there were limited supplies of things, if what they wanted to use someone else grabbed first, then they were going to have to adaptively adjust to that. So get their DARF on, if you will. Um, 
so they had three hours to, to set something up. We gave them an hour over lunch. That wasn't the original intent, but we let them eat lunch together, which gave them some time to sort of talk about things in person and then send them back to their corners. Um, we gave them four hours to build it on the floor and document it up in the office. They had to document something that matched what they built. It took an eternity to judge, or so everybody seemed to think that day. And then we gave out um, some prizes. What a lot of teams figured out, and what some did not, was that all we told them that was that they had to take a tennis ball that started on a blue disc, and that ball had to end up in a red basket. So a lot of fair, the bucket could go, the stick could go, the basket could move, the disc could move, and the ball just had to get from one to the other. So not being limited by the original setup was one of the things that, that benefited some teams. So what does a winning design look like? Um, I'm actually going to bop down for this. So this was the winning team for creativity, and it turned out well. Gorgeous. To film it, his reaction was substantially more excited the first time because not all of them worked. We gave him four hours and a bunch of, you know, duct tape. Um, not everything kind of came together as nicely as their plan suggested. But I want, if I can, if I can do this, I want to point to a couple of things in this particular yeah. video. You know, Gorgeous. The blue disc was actually in the arm swinging around, so they didn't actually start at what we told them was the starting point. So that was out of the box thinking. That bar that swung around went out of the plane of the 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 the, uh, the plywood. Remarkable how many teams couldn't get past the fact that they had a platform and everything was on the platform. So the fact that they broke that plane was actually quite creative. The other thing is so that they didn't just take a bunch of junk and chuck it at stuff. They didn't like hoard the materials. We told them if they took it off the pile, they had to use it. Or they got docked for an efficiency charge. So you'll notice they re they repurposed their bucket and everything they didn't use is in there uh, as part of their design. <laughs> so so they use it for weight, and they got rid of all of their 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 waste products like that. So um, this was this was both our winning design for creativity, and as I said, it also happened that they had great documentation, and it worked the first time out. So they ended up winning the entire thing based on all the categories. So let me kind of summarize here a little bit. Okay, what we had is we had a grant to study mobile computing. On top of the grant, we wanted to look at some creativity types of things. So in order for us to look at the creativity, okay, and we've used most of the budget already to entice the students, okay, and to pay for the undergrad students to do all the heavy lifting, and there was a lot of it, okay. We're kind of left with, okay, how do we go back and, and, and look at the creativity aspects of this and answer something interesting to us? Well, there's a couple things that were really interesting to us. One of them is, is we've got a team of four people. If we want to create teams of engineers that are going to go out and be creative, how do we build those teams? So the first thing we thought was, well, we'll make sure that every team, okay, gets a really, really creative person on it, okay? Dr. Gru, okay, and a bunch of minions, okay, that can go back and help do the work and things like that. So that's one plan, right? <clears throat> All right, so what we needed is we needed to have some idea of what the the creative abilities were of the individuals coming into the competition. Now the teams were self-selected. They got to pick on the teams. So all we can do is basically go back and ask them, hey, can you go back and take a quick uh, creativity test of some sort, something cheap, something that you can do fast, bring in the results with that so that we can kind of look after the fact and see how creative the teams were. Okay. Here's the, the measure that we chose to use, okay? It was cheap, it was online, it didn't cost a lot. 
It's not quite the same as we're used to, I guess, now that we know better, okay? <laughs> but we went and we used a Belgian uh, product called the Creax. Creax has eight different areas that it measures, okay? If you actually go back and look at what the Creax is asking you to do, there's things like divergent thinking. There's things like um, making, connections. making connections and a few things like that. Uh, so they have a little bit different measure. Basically then, what we have, this was a, a, one of our, our students. Uh, the blue kite that shows up there might be her scores uh, on abstraction, on persistence, on complexity. Uh, the scores then get put into some kind of an algorithm and they come out with an overall score of 71.31 for this engineer. If you looked at the documentation for the CREAX, the average across everybody who takes the CREAX, okay, runs about 62 and a half, okay? Guess where our students were overall? After 64 students go out and take this thing, we have 64 students uh, with an average about 62 and a half, okay? So our engineers are not outstanding creativity uh, examples here. They're not terrible either, no. Okay, so we've got an individual creativity measure. We also needed to have some way to go back and measure the team creativity at the end. Now we had a couple other things that we, we scored as we went along as well, but these were our creati creativity measures. We basically went back to the, uh, the Guilfold, uh, yeah, I, I'm from Iowa, I pronounce things wrong, okay. <laughs> Uh, so elaboration, fluency, flexibility, originality, and we had some judges to come in to help us look at these things. So we had two engineers, okay, one was a multidisciplinary engineer, uh, mechanical and electrical engineer. We had an industrial engineer in there. Uh, we asked uh, the, the psychologist on our staff at the School of Mines. And uh, ideally we wanted to have uh, uh, the artist Remember, this is a school of science and technology, so we actually have one artist on campus, so we wanted to have her. She had a double commitment, so we had to, had to go with a serial entrepreneur for the other. But we asked them then to look at aesthetics, too. What we did, instead of going back and, and doing uh, a consensual assessment, because, again, the judging was going tremendously long, according to the students, we basically just went, piled up the scores on each one of these things here, and went and took the mean across the four judges. So for this team here, the mean creativity score on just the creativity portion would have been 24.2, okay? So that's the idea we had there. Now if we wanted to go back and find out how the teams did that had very creative people, okay, versus teams that had people of roughly about the same creativity, we had to have a measure there. Again, kind of looking at the simpler is better type method, we took the highest uh, scoring individual on the individual creativity and then we looked and compared that with the difference with the median score for the remaining team members okay so if you had somebody with a high creativity on there their team would have a, a greater uh, difference okay if you had a team with all about the same creativity a smaller difference great okay so would you have predicted something like this? Here's what our first result was when we looked at the team creativity, okay, and the, uh, the difference, okay, on there. The teams that had roughly the same creativity scored higher in the competition. If you had one person that was extremely creative, okay, relative to the rest of their team members, they kind of scored over on the other side. Would you have expected that? Hmm. All right, so we've got another question then. Okay, if this is not what we're going to do, okay, why don't we at least, you know, try and get people with similar creativity on there, okay? So maybe we've got a few teams that have a uh, lower creativity. Maybe there's, uh, as an average, okay, some teams that have higher creativity, okay? And we would expect then, you put a whole bunch of very creative people together, might be good. Take a bunch of people who have a difficult time finding their way out from underneath a wet sack, okay, but forehead's better than one, maybe you get something pretty good too. Okay, we're gonna use what we have and use it to the best ability that we can. Here's what came up out of that, okay. Starting over on the left side, we have our lower creative teams, okay. Our individuals with lower creativity over there. And as it turns out, they're 
right about average, okay? Maybe going from mini C to little c, okay? Then we take the, the average engineers, and you can see that they're average because we've drawn a line right up vertically there where the mean would be. And guess what? We get higher creativity when we put people who are more creative, but they're similar in their creativity on their teams together, okay? So what happens when we put the teams together with the very highest creativity? Ugh. Would you have expected that? Now maybe we're just throwing fuel on the fire here, okay? Because we've got a couple people with some different ideas, okay? But this raises some problems, okay? There's implications for this. And one of the implications is, guess what? This term, there are a whole bunch of engineers just like me, engineering professors, we're teaching classes. And in our disciplines, I've got a facilities design class that has every two years we might get a civil engineer in there. The rest are all industrial engineers. Okay, so they're all from the same discipline. And I'm putting teams together and I'm trying to do things like we're told to do. Get differing capabilities on the team, okay? But we thought that that wasn't necessarily a good way to go about doing that, right? Sometimes I get, I allow the students to pick their teams. And guess what? Some of the smart students like to get back together with some of the other smart students. Smart kind of correlates a little bit with creativity, okay? Is that gonna be effective? No, implications, besides stop me before I teach again, okay? There's lots of implications here. We need some help. So we get to our conclusions. Um, keep in mind, again, that this was sort of a study that we threw together after the fact with a limited amount of information on what we were actually doing. So uh, it, we don't know. Um, <laughs> it's a pilot study. We were hoping to come here to find some information. What we do know is that we raised more questions than we answered. Well, we actually know less now than we did before. Um, but we got to read a lot of literature on creativity, and so we know a lot more of the theory now than we used to. We got a chance to come to Bologna, and so, I mean, it was a win. Um, but, uh, you know, so a lot of it may have been time constraint. We don't know. We're going to start working on figuring this out, and we thought some conversation here would help. So um, we want to thank you for paying attention. This is, in fact, our title slide. Um, <laughs> I'm Andrea Cervek, this is Dean Jensen. We're at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, a school with 2,500 students who cannot graduate with anything other than a, an S at the end, so a BS, an MS, or a PhD, and you have to take calculus to graduate. Thank you very much. So. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question right away. Okay. Due to the fact that maybe creativity is important, Intelligence is important, but personality, when you build a team, comes in too. So if you have to see those very creative people, what kind of personalities they have. What do you think about that? Um, well, in theory, because our team self-selected, they were people that would get along, we hope. So, I, there may, what, one, of the, one of the things that, uh, we've, we've run a couple of theories by on why the, the highly creative groups essentially tanked. And, Part of it may have been that they had so many ideas that they couldn't get them to gel in the period of time we gave them. Or it may have, it may have been what you said, There's, there was a, a, a battle of the wills, if you will, so it's like, no, we're going to put this here, no, we're not. And, and so it, it was an ineffective way to, to get from divergent to convergent. So uh, one thing I would like very much to, uh, to see happen is that you do the same thing, but you don't do the remote part. And the only reason for doing that is that it's not clear at all what impact the remoteness had on anything. So given that this was supposed to be the uh, reason for the grant, uh, the outcome is still rather uncertain. So this is like duplicate bridge. Uh, by by uh, removing a certain number of variations so that you only change one or two things at a time, you may be able to discern more about what works and what doesn't. Absolute agreement. Um, in the grand scheme of let's design a research project, this is not how we would do it. There are far too many, too many variables involved. So. But on the other hand, this is, this is creative accounting that does not get you thrown in jail. Okay, if you've got a grant to study one thing, you do study the one thing. Yes. And on top, you sprinkle a little bit of creativity research. Okay, maybe not so bad. more questions, they need to be quick and quick replies to that, please. 
In the, first of all, very interesting findings. In the best of all possible worlds, if you could um, redo this, combine it with the data you already have, but run the same competition without a monetary reward, and maybe even not use the word competition, but have p everything else would be the same. Um, I do a lot of work on the effect of reward on intrinsic motivation and creativity, and my guess is that those high creative teams that tanked um, it might have been something about the reward and motivation. They might have been reacting to the, the high reward that was at stake differently than some other teams. It's possible. Um, one of the things with our engineering students is that they tend to be motivated in general by the ex, uh, extrinsic um, motivators. So, and particularly competition, we have, we have what I like to refer to as competitively collaborative students. Um, they're sort of driven by competition. So I'm not sure, I think we would have a group of exceptional students that would do really well, um, but I'm not sure we would even get the rest of them to show up is the problem. Okay. Okay. No, no ping pong, please. Okay. Um, I think this is an absolutely fascinating experiment. What one issue I have is that you're not really able to tell within this context the difference between the creativity and the innovation. True. So in other words, within this, you, you have the, 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 the germs of ideas which lead to the successful end product, but you also have this critical innovation stage. And sort of building on what I was talking about yesterday, your high creatives may have been capable of coming out with the, the, the germs of the ideas as individuals, but uh, because they're at the, the non-groupy end of my continuum, um, they're not going to be ideal for the next stage, which is the innovation. So um, I, I would have expected that the ones with, with uh, um, highly creative individuals, but not all in the same bracket, would indeed have produced um, <coughs> Uh, fewer, fewer end products that were successful. Okay. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much again. <laughs> and we close the session in an excellent way, looking at uh, the inspiration that we can derive from nature, bio-inspired design. Uh, this uh, presentation will be delivered by Katharina Kaiser. She's working at the Technical University in, in Munich. She's a mechanical engineer, and the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for the introduction, and um, sorry for, from my side for not attending the conference. I got, a, I got a cold, so I just had the wonderful experience of um, staying at the hotel room instead of um, listening to the talks. But, um, yeah, I hope I... I catch something, catch something this morning. So um, my talk is about creating innovative solution ideas using biology. And um, just short what I wa I'm going to present to you. So at first I will present to you the motivation why I want to do this. Then I will present to you um, the existing search support that is literature based and then the support I, I'm introducing. Then I will introduce to you um, how I ap applicated the approach, and then um, I will show you some work in progress and then outlook on that. So my motivation is to, lo uh, <coughs> to um, support solution search in bio-inspired design. So bio-inspired design for me means that I'm just having technical problems and I'm looking into biology for some solutions. So many biological systems have um, evolved very um, interesting solutions for different kinds of natural um, environmental set problems or challenges they have to face. And so I'm trying to um, support solution search and bio-inspired design. So I have my technical problem, and the question is how to find successful biological solutions for these technical problems. So there are two ways to do it. There are a lot of biomimetic databases that already exist, so people put some biological solutions in there, and um, you can search for them by technical functions. The other um, way to do it is to just look into biological research, look what people found out recently, and look what you perhaps could use for your technical problems. 
So I won't um, use biomimetic databases because I think the, the problem with the databases is that you, um, yeah, people already thought about some solutions for some problems and then they put it into the databases. And if you just use that, then you miss a lot of other solutions that might be out there in biological research. And that's why I'm using biological research articles to just get inspiration for um, solving technical problems. So if you look into literature, all of the people who deal with um, looking into biological literature um, to, have, to get biological solutions, they all dealt with technical functions or they came from technical functions. So they described their technical problems in terms of functions and then um, went looking into biological literature. And as some, very few of them also looked at um, using properties um, of technical systems to just look into biology. Nobody did use the environment, but I think it's very important to also look at the environment because um, all biological systems evolved very strongly with the environment they are set in. And so I think it's, it's um, good to look also at the environment. So that's why the approach uses all those three aspects of technical problems. And it's also nice to think a little bit um, out of the box, out of your technical problem if you also think about the environment that is set in. So then people were trying to bridge the terminology because engineers usually have a, a different terminology than biologists. And they did it in two ways. They just took synonyms out of some synonym generating web pages or they built up bridge terms. So the bridge terms, they, for the bridge terms, they took technical functions and then looked into biological solutions for a certain technical problem and then um, just looked how they, the two um, disciplines described the problems and then just built um, terms that, that bridge those, this gap they found. So what I'm using is synonyms because it's not for all the technical functions and also not for the properties in the environment. There are bridge terms available and then you, it takes a lot of time to just build bridge terms and then you limit yourself a little bit. <clears throat> so in the text source, most of the people were using were books or the internet. Um, very few people um, used research articles. I think it's due to the fact that it is very difficult to understand for engineers to read a biological research article, but there are the results that are most up to date and that's why I'm using this in the approach. So the approach looks like this. You have your technical problem descriptions in terms you think about their functions, the properties, and also the environment your, your problem is set in. And then you, out of this description, you um, extract your search terms. Then you generate variations of the search terms. And this means you um, generate synonyms of your search terms. And you can use WordNet for this. This is a um, lexical database in English that is available on the internet. And if you put something in, it looks like this. So you put in your function in this case, and then you get a lot of um, different words that are um, yeah, having in some contents, context the same meaning as your function, and you can use it. The problem with this WordNet is a little bit that you also get a lot of useful or, uh, useless words. So you have to decide what words are useless, uh, useful and what not. So, and then you are searching by all the search terms in PubMed, and PubMed is some database where a lot of biological research articles are stored, and it's, it's just updating itself all the time. And if you would put in the word, then you would get a lot of biological research articles, and if you click on one of these, then you can get the abstract, and it um, does more or less give an overview of what is in the research article. So, and then in the end, you have a lot of biological research articles, you can um, yeah, draw your inspiration out of. So the two questions are now, does this approach really lead to creative solution ideas? And uh, what, what is more important is that um, can, can these biological inspiration really be used by engineers that have no biological background and therefore um, are not used to, to the terminology and reading those articles? So what we did now is we applied this approach to three, uh, now there, there is more, but at that point it were three, three students of mechanical engineering. 
at the tomb, and there was also one student of mechatronics. He came from Australia and did some exchange program. And I asked them to choose their technical problem by themselves because I wanted that they are really interested in the problem and are really motivated to solve it. So that, what, that is what the um, um, students choose. So the first is the design of a device for purifying water. The other was the design of an adapter surface with variable heat con conductivity. So he wanted to do a cooking pot that is just having a very good um, conductive state when it's on the oven and then if you put it from the oven then the food will still um, stay warm in it so it isolates good then then it was the design of a self-sharpening knife and then the design of a trans reducing mechanism if you just stuff a lot of um, things in your in your luggage so that the, the closing mechanism would not be disturbed and what the students fall out now is um, for the solution for the device of purifying drinking water were aquaporins. So that is um, some channels in the cells and they are very selective to water. So the only thing they let pass are water molecules. And um, what the idea now was instead of if you have under other filtering mechanisms, you only, or in the most of the cases, you filter out all the stuff you don't want to have in. But that would be an idea to just have a filter mechanism that just is very, really um, yeah, adapted to water. So it only lets water through, and then the rest will um, stay out by itself. So um, this is a very innovative thing. That the question is if you really can, can um, yeah, implement it. That's, that's the question with all of these ideas. So they didn't do the, the transferring part. They just did the solution search and the inspiration part of it, so might be a technical problem to just um, do it. Then the other one, um, the adaptive surface with the variable heat conductivity, the student found spider silk. So spider silk has a very high thermal conductivity if you stretch it, and then if you put it in the, the original state again, it's the thermal conductivity just um, um, sinks. So he thought about a cooking pot that is um, made of non-uniform conductive elements, which alignment can be adapted. So if, if it is stretched, then it would be conduct the heat very well when it's on the oven. And if you put it off the oven, then it, it will just um, go to the, to the original state again and will insulate the food better. So then the solution idea for the self-sharpening knife were crab claws. He found... Um, one crab that is having um, non-calcified tips of its claws, and it's that, um, yeah, it added um, a lot of effect to the, um, due to abrasion resistance and resistance to fracture. And what he thought about is transferring this structure of the crab claws just to the, to the self-sharpening knife so that the knife will stay longer sharp. But he also was not so sure about if it is really technically implementable, but um, that has to be seen if it's in the transfer state. And the last one, I think it's the, it's the nicest one because it's also not really the um, biological mechanism that was adapted, but it was just um, the biological system just helped him to, to find or to come to a creative solution idea. It was for this um, tension reducing mechanism for luggage and he looked at mechano sensation in bacteria so what bacteria do is they have mechanosensitive channels and then they can er um, act as an emergency um, relief valve. So if the pressure gets too high in the bacteria, then they can just open some channels and then it's, it will, the pressure will um, vanish. And um, he thought about putting, um, making a luggage which has no, no valves but emergency chambers. So if you just put a lot of stuff in your luggage, then due to pressure, some little chambers will open so the luggage can get in these chambers. And the, the um, advantage, for example, compared to luggage where you can just have, where you do just have um, different zippers that you can open and then you can make it bigger is that in the original state, it's just a sm small. So you don't, if you don't just leave a tiny um, little more space, then it gets in, these emer in one of these emergency chambers and then you don't need the other ones so it doesn't get bigger all at once. And if you look back at the 
the um, research questions I, I asked is, um, okay, there were creative solution ideas. The problem is that it is not sure if the solutions ideas are really realizable. And people had no problem with drawing biological inspiration from those research articles. So um, they, they told me that it is difficult to read it and that in some points of time they had to use additional literature, for example, books and so on, to, to just um, understand what is going on. But for, for inspiration, it was very good. And what's the big problem with this now is that you get a large amount of search results. So if you go for PubMed and just put your search terms in, you can get, for example, hundreds and thousands of um, search results and nobody wants to go through that or can go through that. And that's what, um, what's really the, um, the thing I'm working on now is how do you know which relevant or which papers are relevant for your technical problem? How much time do I have? Ah, okay, <laughs> I'll make that. And um, the idea is now we semi-automated this part of the approach in a software so the, the student or the user can just put in the search terms and then it variates the words with WordNet and it also searches in PubMed and then you get a list of um, publications. And what we are searching, uh, uh, thinking about now is because you, you can't tell which papers are the most useful ones for the um, device of purifying water. It was, for example, that those publications where the search terms are in a high number of it in, they, um, they were more useful. But for the other problems, this didn't work out. So we are thinking of doing a graph-based view of all those papers and then giving the user the opportunity to cluster it. So cluster it, for example, um, by the number of search terms or cluster it by the number um, of different categories it, the search terms are from or um, cluster it by topic or by author. And so the, the user has manageable packages of publications that he can look into. Okay, that's it. So I'm looking forward to the Thank you very much for a very inspiring presentation. Questions? Please. Please. <laughs> um, in the U.S., in, in educating engineers, um, we have ABET, which is our accrediting organization and is um, somewhat draconian in telling us how to do this. And ABET requires all of our engineers to have chemistry and physics and some other science. Um, I'm of the opinion that it would be more helpful in, in this day and age if they had chemistry, physics, and biology. And I'm wondering if, if, do you think this is something that would benefit all engineers, or? I think so, because I think it's, you will find, or in my opinion, you will find for every technical problem, you can find um, some biological system that might help you. So I'm, I'm not so sure if it's just because I'm a biologist, as, as I studied biology, and then I just went to mechanical engineering. And I think for this research articles, I'm not so sure if it really would make that much sense if they had some one biology course because I also, you understand what you are really into and the rest of it, it's also hard for biologists to really get the point. Perhaps it's a little bit, yeah, it would help a little bit, but um, yeah, I'm not so sure if this is really the solution, but I think it's, this looking into biology is, is helpful for, yeah, a lot of problems. Okay, I see no more hands, so I thank you very much again. And I, in closing the sessions, I want to give you two pieces of information. One is that on top of this building, there's a beautiful terrace with a beautiful view of Bologna. Today, we have the sunshine. Now, the last day, we prepare that for you. There are only two elevators, so it takes a little while to move all of you up there. So take the coffee break if you want. Go upstairs and see and come back. Uh, since we are seven minutes late, we will start 10 minutes later. So we start at 10.50. The Marconi Symposium will start at 10.50, and that's the second piece of information. So enjoy your coffee break. See you here sharp at 10.50.